Hey, turn uh, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Uh, I know it seems like we're uh, uh, going slow, plodding along at this point. We're only in Acts chapter 2, and it's the third week. We've got uh, nine, uh, eight more, nine more weeks after today. Uh, but if you haven't been here, let me introduce uh, what we're doing is we're on this journey uh, through the book of Acts. So as Luke says... In my first book, Theophilus, I wrote about, in the Gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And what we had talked about in the first week and the second week was that Acts is about all that Jesus continues to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, crucified, dead, buried, raised again, and he spends 40 days training his disciples. Now he is ascended into heaven, and he is, send, he is sending the Holy Spirit on his people, the 120 followers that have gathered. And what happens is, if you were here last week, so the Spirit comes down, and there is a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Uh, and uh, it's so powerful, it's so amazing that it attracts thousands of other people who were not in the house where the 120 were. Thousands of other people come. And um, what they hear is the mighty works of God being proclaimed in languages that the speakers, the 120, didn't know, hadn't learned. And so these faithful Jewish followers who were coming to Jerusalem for Pentecost from all places, north, south, east, and west, from different regions with different languages, they hear the mighty works of God. And I would say that's the gospel of what God has done through Jesus. They hear it in their own language. And they're amazed, and they're perplexed, and they say, what does this mean? And Peter's going to tell us what it means. But there are some cynics there who apparently just hear gibberish. They don't hear the mighty works of God. They don't hear the gospel, and they say, these guys are just drunk. So Peter's going to get up, and he's going to tell us what it means that the Spirit has come on the 120. What is this? So if you would, please stand. I'll read. It's Exodus chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. It's a long narrative. Uh, I'm going to skip a little bit the part that, that Samson read, which is the prophecy from Joel. I'll skip that a little bit, and we'll forward on a little bit. But here it is. This is God's Word. Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and that was that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh and everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter goes on. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption." You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, 
that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness, and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Father, your word is trustworthy and true. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you are able to change hard hearts and change lives because of what you have done for us through Jesus. Father, I pray that your spirit would work in us and through us, would electrify us and give us great passion for your word and the good news of the gospel. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. So a couple of things that I like to do uh, whenever I, I'm preaching. So uh, I know a fair number of people in here, and I've gotten to know some other people through the young adult study and through the men's group. Um, but I, when I preach, uh, I may have said this the first week too, I don't assume that everybody is at the same place in your faith journey. So I, I, I know that a lot of people here are experienced in church. Uh, and that's awesome. I was so blessed by the breadth of experience and the wisdom in the men's Bible study on Tuesday night. Uh, it was so cool to see. However, I also generally assume that there are people who are here who are newer to the church, newer to the gospel, uh, and not yet familiar with the Bible. Uh, and so I want to uh, do my best to try to encourage and exhort and to challenge those who are already believers, but I also want to make sure that I give a clear presentation of the gospel, of what it is that God did through Jesus, so that if you're not yet a Christian, uh, that you can have a basic understanding of what the gospel is. Because that truly is why we're here. Uh, we're not here just for, for me to give you more information because I went to seminary, graduate school, whatever. Uh, what we want is transformation. So it's not enough for us to just know more facts about Jesus, but what we're after is a real encounter with the risen, ascended, reigning Jesus Christ. Uh, and so I'll just ask that if you're experienced uh, in the gospel and you're a mature Christian and you feel like I've kind of uh, made something elementary, just bear with me. Uh, and if you're here and you're not familiar with kind of, you know, I can use Christian jargon or churchy jargon. If there's something that I say that you're like, hey, that didn't make sense to me, just come and ask me uh, uh, after the service or text me later on or come and ask Pastor David too. So, okay. So, uh, three things that we learn uh, here about Peter's sermon. And this is the first sermon uh, that's ever preached. And remember, Peter is generally an uneducated, un unskilled fisherman. Uh, and here he is, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He preaches the first sermon. And there's some qualities of the sermon that are instructive for us. And that is, 
if we're Christians and we're considering how do we share the gospel with the people around us, then this is some important stuff to know. Uh, the first thing is this, that Peter appeals to Scripture. And for him, this is going to be the Old Testament. That is, for us, we call it the Old Testament. For him, the Hebrew, Hebrew Scriptures would have been, you know, Genesis through Malachi, the law and the prophets and the writings. But that Peter appeals to Scripture, and that's really, really important for us as we consider sharing the mighty works of God, the gospel with friends, that it's not just our imagination. It's not just fanciful things that we think of that this person needs to know, but it's what God says in his word, the truth about Jesus. Okay. The second thing we learn is that Peter appeals to the mind of his listeners. He appeals to reason and to facts uh, as he presents the gospel to his listeners. Okay, and we're going to explore that a little bit more. And then the last thing that we're going to see is that Peter appeals. There is an appeal, there is an impact on the heart. Okay, again, it's not just intellectually assenting to the facts and the theology. It's about God the Holy Spirit working in your heart and in your life and changing you and adopting you as his child. Okay, so we're going to see Peter appeals to Scripture. Peter appeals to the mind, reason, facts. And then Peter appeals to the heart. Okay, so first things first. Peter appeals to Scripture. Uh, he rebuts the challenge that these men are drunk. Because it's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock. And you're saying the faithful Jews who are here in Jerusalem for Pentecost, they're not drunk as you suppose. And what Peter says, and we talked some a little bit last week, is that this is what was promised by the prophet Joel. In Joel chapter 2, and that's the passage that Samson read, that it was a promise that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh, on all believers. We mentioned this last week that uh, we looked at the incident in Numbers chapter 11, right, where Moses is doing all the work. Moses is the David Fresh of the Old Testament, right? He's doing everything. And then his father in law wisely says, Hey, you know what? You can't do everything. You need some help. So pick 70. I want you to pick 70 men, and I'm going to take from the spirit that is on you, and I'm going to put it on the 70. You remember that? And there's a couple of people that weren't there, and word gets back to Joshua that those couple of elders, the, the two of the 70, that they were also, they were demonstrating that God the spirit was on them. And Joshua's like, hey, what's the deal? I thought this was all a Moses show. And Moses says, remember this, would that God would pour out his spirit on all of his people. That's Moses' desire, that God, the, God would pour out his spirit on all of his people. That desire of Moses becomes a promise, a prophecy in Joel. And Peter says, they're not drunk. This is a fulfillment of scripture. Elsewhere, we see in verses 25 through 28, Peter quotes Psalm 110, a Psalm of David. David, Israel's best greatest king for all of his flaws, Israel's best and greatest king, wrote some Psalms as he was moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wrote, Peter says that when David says in Psalm 110, you're not going to let your Holy One see decay. Peter says that David was talking about Jesus. Peter also quotes Psalm 16 which is where David writes, the Lord, Adonai, Yahweh, God, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Well, wait a minute, David's a king. Who's, who's ahead of David besides God? And Peter says, David was talking about Jesus. That God said to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago at the Young Adult Study. At the end of Luke, after his resurrection, Jesus appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
They're kept from recognizing him. Uh, you can look this up in Luke chapter 24. They're kept from recognizing him. He walks along with them and they're despondent. They're like, oh man, you know, we're so, we're so sad. We had thought that this, and, and Jesus is like, hey, what are you guys talking about? They don't know that it's Jesus. And they say, well, these things that have happened in Jerusalem, are, are you new here? You don't know about this? You say, well, what things? Tell me about these things. They say, well, you know, this Jesus, a man mighty in words and deeds and stuff, we had thought he was going to be the Savior of Israel. But he was crucified. However, some of our own company said that he was raised from the dead. He's not in the tomb anymore. And Jesus gives them a, a sort of a, a pastoral rebuke. He says, oh, foolish, foolish, foolish people. Wasn't it written that the Christ had to suffer and die? And then Luke says this, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that is the entire Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. It says, Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures Concerning what? The sacrificial system? The Ten Commandments? The thou shalt, the thou shalt nots? That Jesus explained to them what was said in Scripture concerning what? Himself. Jesus says, Peter say, is saying here, and Peter will say, Paul is going to say as well. The New Testament writers look back at the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and they say everything in those scriptures points to Jesus. That is really, really important for us to know. So when you're going through the scriptures and you, let's say you start off in Genesis and you're at Genesis chapter three and there's the mess in the garden and the fall and God is pronouncing judgment. And in Genesis three, God says to the serpent, you know what? You're going to be cursed above all livestock. And I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. In Genesis 3, there's a promise that a descendant of Eve and Adam is going to crush the head of the serpent. And the gospel writers and early church leaders and theologians throughout history have said, that is a proclamation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that that's about Jesus. And then you look at other circumstances, you look in Genesis and you look at Joseph being un, uh, wrongfully thrown into the pit and going into uh, bondage in Egypt, but he rises up. And because of his power and his station, as second only to Pharaoh, that his people are saved. He uses his power and position for the benefit of other people. And the gospel writers and theologians say that's about Jesus. And we talked about it last week too. You look at the Exodus and the Passover, right? The blood of the sacrifice and God passes over. He spares you because of the blood of the sacrifice, the perfect spotless lamb of God without blemish. And the gospel writers and the epistle writers and theologians and church leaders say that's about Jesus. That the Old Testament scriptures are about Jesus. That's what Jesus says. It's all about me. That's really helpful when you're reading the Old Testament. But it's also important for you when you're sharing your faith with somebody who doesn't yet believe, a family member or a friend or a coworker that you take them to the scriptures. It's not just your opinion, your helpful advice. It's God's inerrant authoritative word for them. Peter appeals to scripture and says this, God raised Jesus from the dead and everything that you're seeing here, the pouring of the spirit, the gospel in different languages is a fulfillment of the promise from Joel. All right, the second thing that Peter does, he appeals to the mind of the reason. Now, I, I like this. Um, I used to think that I, I was uh, not emotional, but uh, in fact, my, I, my daughter, this is going to be on, I, I hope she doesn't see it. My daughter called me a robot because I didn't cry at her wedding. So <laughs> I'm not a robot. Um, but uh, 
I get, I get super emotional nowadays. But back in the day, when I first heard the gospel when I was 13 until I actually committed my life to Christ at age 23, uh, I approached it from a, a very intellectual, not, not that I'm super smart or anything, but it was just a mind thing. Um, and I thought that it was completely rational and reasonable uh, that the gospel that was presented to me by some godly, faithful leaders who put up with a vast array of stuff from me, um, that was always appealing to me. But if you'll notice that, that Peter appeals to the mind and to reason and to facts. He says in verses 22 through 24 that you people in the crowd... Now remember, this is, this is not just the 120. These are thousands of people descended on Jerusalem. Many of them may have been there since the Passover weekend, and they've stuck around uh, until Pentecost, you know, for seven weeks, eight weeks, things like that. Um, but Peter s assumes, and maybe he knows people in the audience, but he says these things that have happened uh, centered on Jesus that you yourselves know. So clearly... There are people in the large crowd who have been around Jerusalem for the last few years. And maybe they've come in for special feasts and festivals. But these people have seen the teaching of Jesus. These people have seen the miracles of Jesus. These people have seen the mighty works of God through Jesus. Peter says, you yourselves know what's going on. It's a matter of public record. I, uh, we're going to get to this uh, eventually. Uh, when we talk about the gospel going to government officials and philosophers and such, but uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorites is uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're going to talk about Paul's conversion or Saul's conversion and stuff like that. But Paul will say it this way. He will say in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. This is public record. Paul is saying that Jesus, the risen Jesus, appeared to more than 500 people after his resurrection. Most of whom are still alive. In other words, you don't believe me? Go ask. These people are still around. You can bet that what I'm telling you is true, right? And we talked about it. Luke interviewed many of these people in writing his gospel and Acts. I have investigated everything carefully and I've written down an orderly account so that you may know the certainty of the facts appealing to the mind, to reason, to logic, the facts. Later on, Paul is going to be uh, before the... Judean king Agrippa and uh, governor Festus. And he's going to say this uh, in Acts chapter 26. He is given a chance to present the gospel to the highest government officials. And he says to King Agrippa, he says, you know about our ways uh, in Judaism. And I'm going to tell you my story. And Paul goes into his story. And at the end he says, but you know these things, Agrippa. You know that what I'm saying is true because these things were not done in a corner. In other words, this is a matter of public record that real people have seen the risen Jesus. That is absolutely crucial. In 2 Peter, this same Peter who's delivering the sermon is going to say, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John in his gospel is going to say the things that we have seen, the things that we have heard, the things that our hands have touched, that's what we're proclaiming to you. That you were on solid ground. 
And I want you to have confidence to know that when you're presenting the gospel, I know it's not just information, right? You want the spirit to be involved. You want the spirit to work in somebody's heart. You need to be praying that way. But you can have confidence that the gospel is reasonable and rational. It's based on facts. It's based on evidence. The risen Jesus. All right. And the last thing is this. That Peter appeals to the heart. Uh, this is where it gets really personal. In, uh, in verse 23 and again in verse um, 36. Remember thousands of faithful Jews coming from all different regions around, making the journey to Jerusalem for the Passover, for the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost or whatever, uh, and they're there. Uh, now, it is, it is possible that um, before the Passover weekend, and that's when Jesus was crucified, right? It is possible, and I would say it's even likely, uh, and this isn't my opinion, scholarly, you know, other people smarter than I am, it's possible, even likely, that some of the people in this crowd in Acts chapter 2 were there when Jesus entered Jerusalem. When the crowds were chanting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's possible. And even likely. It is also possible and even likely that some of these who are in this crowd hearing the gospel in their own language, it's also possible and likely that they were in the crowd who shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify Jesus. We want Barabbas. Release Barabbas to us. Crucify Jesus. It's possible. And even likely. Because Peter says twice in verse 23 and in verse 36, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, a little bit of an aside, a little bit of kind of a, a footnote, is that that... Uh, proclamation has been misused and misunderstood to say, okay, it's the Jews who killed Jesus. It's been used for anti-Semitic reasons, anti-Jewish hatred. See, the Jews killed Jesus. That's not what Peter is saying. He is saying that they were involved because we know that in the Gospels we see it, that the Jewish religious leaders from very early on in his ministry, were out to get Jesus. And that they did, in fact, hand him over to the Roman authorities where he was tried, crucified. Correct? But Peter is not saying that it's just Jewish guilt or just Roman guilt. He's speaking to everyone in the crowd and saying, this Jesus whom you crucified. And I think it's fair to say that it wasn't just the Jewish religious leaders who handed Jesus over. And it wasn't just the Roman authorities who sent him, nailed him to the cross and crucified him. It was my sin that put Jesus there. This Jesus whom you and I crucified. There is a tendency for us, when we look back to the events, to say, oh, I would have been in the crowd that was chanting, Hosanna to the son of David. I wouldn't have been one shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We love to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Wherever you would have been in the crowd, the testimony of all of Scripture is that my sin condition, my heart waywardness to turn away from God and to turn and do my own thing, that sin condition is so cosmically bad that it cost the Son, the son of God his life. That's why Jesus went to the cross, because of me. And we can all say that. My sin is what put Jesus on the cross. There's a great, uh, a couple of hymns. Uh, John Newton, you'll know, is, uh, wrote Amazing Grace. He wrote another hymn called Looking at the Cross. And it says this in, in the fourth stanza of Looking at the Cross. John Newton says this, My conscience felt and owned 
my guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. That's what's going on here. This Jesus, whom you and I crucified. In Charles Wesley's great hymn, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? When I was in, uh, in high school, I remember I heard the gospel when I was 13. I was in high school. It was a, a youth trip uh, to go from my hometown of Memphis out to Colorado. And if you're not familiar with Young Life, high school ministry, uh, outreach ministry to high school kids, I was not a Christian, but the way they do it is they gather all these kids, you take them skiing, and every night you sing and you have a presentation of the gospel from a, a speaker. And uh, they, they begin uh, the first night, the second night, third night, and it kind of builds up until the night where they say, okay, I want you to take all that we've said. I want you to go sit by yourself and want you to consider committing your life to Christ. And I remember this very clearly that I was sitting by myself on steps. Uh, it, was, it was winter in Colorado. Uh, it was beautiful. And I remember saying to God, these things that happened 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross, what does that have to do with me? I wasn't there. I didn't shout crucify him. I didn't nail him to the tree. And it was made plain to me over the years as friends and as pastors and mentors and as the Holy Spirit made it clear to me, I had everything to do with Jesus on the cross. It was my sin that put him there. We also tend to minimize our sin. If you're, if you're a good, decent, and moral person, uh, which I was not, if you're a good, decent, and moral person, it's easy to say, well, of course. Yeah, I, I, I go to church. Uh, I give generously. Uh, I'm involved with all this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not so bad. I didn't put Jesus on the cross. In Psalm 25, verse 11, King David says, For your name's sake, O Lord, forgive my guilt, because it is great. He didn't say, Israel's best king. He didn't say, forgive my guilt, Lord, it's not that big of a deal. He said, forgive me, O Lord, my guilt is great. We always tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. If you're one of those people and you're a good, decent, moral person, that, that's, that's absolutely awesome and I'm glad that you're here. However, that's not the end of the story. The end of your journey is for you to be cut to the heart like these listeners were and to say, what must I do? And if you're not yet a Christian, then talk to me. Talk to Pastor David. Talk to a Christian friend or family member that our sin put Jesus on the cross. There, there's another error that we make. Uh, if like me, uh, you were really wayward uh, and really so bad uh, and you really messed up and you made a mess of your life and all this kind of stuff and then you hear the gospel, you're like, you know what? That's too good to be true. I'm too bad. Then you have missed the good news of the gospel. That God sends Jesus to seek and to save the lost, right? To leave the 99, to follow after the one who is wayward. To welcome back the prodigal when we repent, we return. That God welcomes us with open arms. It's really the height of arrogance to think that your sin is greater than God's mercy and God's forgiveness at the cross. You're not being humble, <laughs> you're being proud. Your sin is not so great that the blood of Jesus Christ won't cover it. And you can be adopted as a child of the King. That's the good news of the gospel. Uh, I'm going to pray for us. And I would just ask that uh, when I'm praying that you would be, one, praying that, that this gospel would be fresh to us now.
that we would become as passionate as when we were first uh, brought into the family of God. But also, uh, if you're not yet a Christian and you want to explore more, then please come and talk to me or talk to a Christian friend. Okay, so I'm going to invite the worship team back up uh, and then uh, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel that you, um, that your word is trustworthy and true. Uh, we thank you that uh, this, this amazing golden thread of redemption that runs from Genesis to Revelation is about Jesus. And I pray that you would exalt Jesus in our minds and in our hearts, that we would see him, that we would fall on our feet in worship, that we would be thankful for him, uh, that we would praise you for your grace and your mercy in Jesus. Father, I also thank you uh, that this is true, that we're not following cleverly devised tales, that it's not just our imaginations or wishful thinking, but that this really happened, that you entered into our lives and rescued us and redeemed us through Jesus. Father, I also pray that you would continue to work in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would renew us today, energize us and empower us to grow in the gospel and to share it boldly. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.